Good morning. I think I've gotten the high sign. Good morning to all of you. Welcome to the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. I'm Mike Van Dusen, the Executive Vice President. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this uh, day-long conference focusing on the 2010 strategic concept for NATO. Uh, the Woodrow Wilson Center serves as the nation's living and official memorial to our 28th President. To honor this man of ideas, the nation's only president to hold a um, Ph.D., uh, as well as being a politician, the U.S. Congress created in 1968 this Institute of Advanced Research, not a monument of marvel. Here at the Wilson Center, we, as Wilson tried to do, seek to bridge the worlds of scholarship and policy by bringing together the thinkers and the doers, academics, policymakers, journalists, business people, scientists, in a robust dialogue on the key public policy issues of the day. This conference today is an example of the Wilson Center's mission in action. We face a world of increasingly complex and ever more urgent security challenges, including terrorism, organized crime, cybersecurity, and environmental threats due to global warming. In the past, the United States has joined with its partners in Europe to build a security architecture that would protect the transatlantic alliance from Cold War threats. Twenty years after the fall of the Berlin Wall, NATO has expanded to include new members, and, but it has not undertaken fundamental reforms to address the new realities of the post-Cold War period. The new 2010 strategic concept attempts to address these shortcomings and move NATO into the new century. A group of experts chaired by Dr. Ma Madeleine Albright drafted this document, which was presented in Brussels on Monday. Our speakers today will help us to understand better the context of this uh, document and the implications it will have for transatlantic security and NATO's institutional structure. Before I introduce our two speakers, I would like to uh, recognize and thank our co-sponsor, the Joint Baltic American uh, National Committee, um, J-Bank, which serves as a voice in Washington for the one million strong Baltic American community. Many thanks to the members of J-Bank's board who are here today and to Carl Alto, the managing director of J-Bank, for the essential role he played in helping to bring this conference together. I would also like to recognize the high, hard work of our European Studies Program staff especially Elizabeth Zalatukhina, uh, Andri Peros, uh, Christina Tervesa, uh, Tim McDonald, and Nita uh, Gilages in putting this meeting together. The conference simply could not have come off without their diligent, strong commitment and leadership. Our European Studies program worked closely with the three embassies, and we are pleased to welcome uh, Ambassador Andres Pil Pilovics of L Latvia. I don't know if he's here yet this morning, but he is welcome to the center. It is my privilege to introduce uh, two, our first uh, speakers for this first panel. Kurt Volker, who is here with us, is the managing director and senior fellow at the Center for Transatlantic Relations at Johns Hopkins University SICE School of Advanced International Studies. He just has had a distinguished career in the American Foreign Service for more than two decades, serving under four administrations. His last posting, I believe, was as United States Ambassador to NATO. I am also happy to welcome Jamie Shea. Uh, who is joining us via video conference from NATO headquarters in Brussels, where he's Director of Policy Planning in the private office of the Secretary General. In addition to his NATO responsibilities, Jamie also holds a number of academic positions, most notably with the College of Europe in Bruges and the Brussels School of International Studies uh, of the University of Kent. Welcome to both our speakers. I believe that um, Ambassador Volker will lead off. Ambassador Volk. Okay. Thank you very much and uh, delighted to be here. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, Jamie, it is great to see you uh, on the television screen. Um, you have literally become a talking head. <laughs> <laughs> uh, ja uh, Jamie and I have known each other for about, uh, I don't know, 11 years, 12 years, something like that. Um, um, 
particularly when I worked in the private office of Secretary General Lord Robertson, and uh, Jamie uh, had just finished uh, his time as the spokesman of the alliance and moving on to be the director of uh, public diplomacy, and now he's the head of the planning unit and uh, the principal driver within the NATO uh, uh, apparatus of the strategic concept work. And I just want to tell a story. I've been speaking so much about this in the last couple of weeks. Uh, I haven't actually had a chance to do this, but uh, a little over a year ago, probably a year and a half ago at this point, uh, I remember very well a dinner or a lunch, one or the other, it must have been a lunch, where Jamie and I got together with his staff and my staff. It was a lunch, <laughs> thank you, a lunch. And we talked about um, how do you get from here to there on a new NATO strategic concept. And uh, we each had uh, some different ideas, and one idea that we had in common was that we needed to get some outside experts together. Uh, and we needed to do two things. We needed to get smarter as an alliance, and we needed to make sure that we were engaging people outside the NATO, you know, inside the box NATO, out, outside the NATO bureaucracy. And uh, it, I then left not too long after that lunch, uh, but the idea took hold and has gone through a number of transformations and a number of uh, permutations and a number of conferences. And uh, the result of that process is that we now have a group of experts report, a distinguished panel that was led by Madeleine Albright, and it has set the stage for the work yet to come on producing NATO's actual strategic concept. Uh, so that was some of the origins of that. Now, what I would like to do, and Jamie, I hope you're in agreement with this, is I would like to talk a little bit about the context of why we're doing a NATO strategic concept, where we are in the world, and how getting NATO to think about its role fits. And then, Jamie, I'm hoping that you might address more of the contents of where this is and where it goes from here. Uh, so I'll be um, may maybe a little bit backward looking and you'll be a little bit forward looking, I suppose. The uh, context, as I would put it, is that uh, we had after the end of the Second World War, a very well thought out and a very well constructed effort to sustain an international order that was going to provide for security, stability, and nurture democracy, rule of law, human rights, a growing, prosperous, market-based global economy. And we, this was done by our forefathers through institutions such as creating the United Nations and the UN Declaration on Human Rights, uh, creating the, the Bretton Woods institutions of the IMF and the World Bank, uh, pushing for the creation of the European coal and steel community, which has blossomed into the European Union, also NATO as a security arm for protecting uh, this transatlantic democratic community, which in the 1940s and 50s was the heart of where a democratic values-based international order resided and grew from there. Now that said, um, this worked out very well, although it was a very tense period during the Cold War. We did nurture the development of these values in the world. We did provide for a sustainable basis of global security and stability. And we graduated from that in a way. Uh, we had a major shock to this system in 1989 when the bipolar order collapsed and we saw freedom and democracy have the opportunity to spread through Central and Eastern Europe. We saw the collapse of the Soviet Union replaced by a, a new modern Russia uh, in Russia's borders rather than Soviet Union's borders. Uh, we've seen the growth of prosperity and democratic systems uh, and security through much wider swaths of the world than was the case when you go back to the 1940s. But that said, we've also seen an explosion of problems since 1989. And I think 2001 and the September 11 attacks was another shock to the system, at least here in the United States, but I think globally, because it illustrated that just because the old security challenges we dealt with after World War II and through the Cold War have been managed, doesn't mean that security has been managed. In fact, uh, we face a plethora of new kinds of threats and challenges that stem from a new kind of global order that's emerging. And they include violent extremism, terrorism, proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, consequences of failed or failing states and weak governance, which leads to crime, leads to um, uncontrolled migration, can lead to competition for resources, and on and on. Uh, so we face a whole new set of challenges. NATO has adapted significantly 
And this, I think, is important for people to understand as a starting point. Beginning really in the early 90s, and especially with 1995, NATO took on more and different kinds of challenges than it had ever done during the years of the Cold War. And if you just take a, a snapshot in time, and let's say before 1995, uh, NATO had 16 members, had no partners, had never conducted a military operation. Uh, it had done a lot of defense planning, had done a lot of exercising, created a deterrent, but had not actively taken on very much. And then beginning with Bosnia in 1995, first through a bombing campaign to stop the fighting and the ethnic cleansing and the, and the siege of Sarajevo, and then continuing with a substantial peacekeeping operation through I-4, later becoming S-4. Same thing in Kosovo. And then increasingly, NATO has been engaged in a variety of things. And I'll just tick off a number of them just to remind. Uh, NATO provided humanitarian relief in Pakistan after a major earthquake. It provided humanitarian relief in the United States after Hurricane Katrina by delivering that by airlift, transported African Union troops to Darfur, and is engaged in helping train the African Union itself and improving its peacekeeping capabilities. It is going after pirates off the coast of Somalia. Uh, it has uh, been substantially engaged in defense transformation in Central and Eastern Europe, in the Balkans, uh, in the East. It has uh, over 20 partners in Eurasia, seven in North Africa and uh, the Middle East, another four or five in the Persian Gulf. It's working together with Australia, Japan, uh, Korea, others uh, in Afghanistan. And of course, its largest and most challenging operation right now is leading the ISAF operation in Afghanistan under a UN mandate. Uh, so NATO has adapted by taking on operational roles. It has adapted by building partnerships with people around the world, with countries around the world, and is adapted also by bringing in new members for those countries who are European and who've become democracies and market economies and want to contribute to a common security space. It has said, we are open. You can join if you meet the standards of membership, and a dozen countries have since 1995. Uh, we're now at a total of 28 countries in NATO. Uh, it has built partnerships with Russia and Ukraine and, and Georgia and others. So that has been a significant adaptation. But what has happened at the same time is that our publics and political leaders have lost the, the sense that we know what NATO's for. What is it doing? Why are we engaged in all of these things? Is this just a never-ending expansion of NATO's activities into areas that, frankly, many of us may not be comfortable with? Are, are we are fighting, we're doing combat in Afghanistan, uh, we're in Iraq training the military leadership, we are far away from Europe. Uh, we have more members than we ever imagined, and more are still seeking to join. Uh, where does this end, and why are we doing this? And I think these are the questions that uh, publics in all of our countries have. And it's a fair question. Even though I think NATO has done a remarkable job at adapting to security challenges, if we can't make a credible case as to why and what we're doing, uh, we're going to lose the sustainable public support that we depend upon to resource our defense commitments to ensure we have the political will to meet the challenges that we're dealing with uh, in the 21st century. So that was the genesis of uh, the need for a NATO strategic concept revision. Uh, we had one immediately after the fall of the Berlin Wall in, in, in 1991. Uh, we had another one in 1999. It's been over 10 years since that one was uh, developed, and a lot has happened in those 10 years. That one was being written just as NATO was going into Kosovo for the first time. Since then, we've had this growth of the roles and, and missions of NATO. Uh, we've had the September 11 attacks. We've had the Operation Afghanistan. And it's high time that we have another effort to explain what NATO's for. Now, that said, NATO has adapted a lot, and it is going through this effort of producing this kind of strategic concept. At the same time that it has done this, the world has kept changing, and perhaps changed even more. And I would say that there are a number of issues that are of deep concern to our publics uh, today that go beyond what NATO is even itself able to tackle. For example, uh, I'll, I'll list uh, about six of these. Uh, you have the phenomenon of globalization, which I think is very worrying to publics that have been accustomed to a fair amount of stability. Globalization seems to be a source of instability because it creates new things, new contacts, 
lower costs in foreign countries that bring in products or people. It eases communication, which it eases transportation. It eases cheap goods. It in introduces foreign capital. It becomes a much more competitive, flat environment in the world, uh, which is unsettling if we've gotten used to something very comfortable. And I think that's where a lot of our publics feel themselves is, is this is challenging. We're losing jobs, we're losing markets, we're seeing a financial crisis that has global dimensions, uh, we're seeing a euro crisis, we're seeing um, a global recession. It, it is very unsettling. Second thing I think that people are concerned about is within this a number of rising powers that are new and different and outside the framework that we've been accustomed to. Uh, it had been a Eurocentric and transatlantic centric world back in the 1940s and 50s and 60s. And that, of course, has changed over time, but it is dramatically underscored now when we see the rise of a power like China or of India or of Brazil or of South Africa. We, we saw the role just played this week by Turkey and Brazil trying to deal separately with Iran. Uh, we're seeing a diversification and a dispersal of the instruments of power in the world, uh, both economic, military, uh, and political power in the world, which again is unsettling compared to what we had been comfortable with, and we need to adjust to this uh, new developing world order. Um, another issue that I think has risen to the top of people's agendas is energy. In addition to the financial and economic crisis, people are very concerned about where their energy is coming from, who are we getting it from, and, and where is that money going when we give it to them to buy the energy, and then when we consume it, what are we doing to our environment and to the climate? Uh, so this is a major source of challenge as well. Uh, another one, uh, nuclear weapons has been in the news a lot lately. I don't think that people are getting up every day worried about a U.S.-Russian nuclear balance. They are, however, worried about the proliferation of uh, weapons of mass destruction and nuclear technologies, uh, which in the wrong hands could create an actual nuclear use. Uh, one of the <laughs> phenomena, again, after the end of World War II, there, there hasn't been a use of nuclear weapons or weapons of mass destruction by a state. Um, it is imaginable, looking ahead, that you could see some kind of use of weapons of mass destruction. Um, this goes along with the sense that there is an ideological challenge as well. Uh, violent extremism going on in many parts of the world, and particularly uh, in a broader Middle East region, and particularly what we've seen in Iraq and Afghanistan, is very unsettling as well. We see a lot more violence in the last few years than we are, uh, have been accustomed to, than we are comfortable with, and, and, it, and it has ripples back into our own community, whether it's terrorist attacks or attempted terrorist attacks, such as we had just a few weeks ago in this country, or in London, or in Madrid, or the radicalization of communities within our own societies. Uh, so this is another phenomenon that people are concerned about. And when you stack all of these up, uh, there is a sense also that our institutions are failing, uh, whether it is national governments, or, and look at this country and the popularity of the Congress, for example, um, look at uh, the European Union and the uh, moves toward renationalization of policies within the European Union, look at the confidence in the UN to solve many of these challenges, look at the uh, uh, recoil at uh, some of the financial institutions in the world, um, look at uh, NATO as well. That uh, I don't think that people see the connection between what NATO's doing and this long list of other things that they are genuinely worried about. Now, I don't uh, mean to suggest that NATO is the answer to all of these challenges. It's not. Uh, I think we have a much wider set of challenges facing our societies that leaders need to grapple with, including grappling with the economic side and changing the uh, the forms of uh, international coordination, moving, for example, as we've done from uh, G8 coordination to G20. There are other things uh, that need to be done as well. But within that, there is a role for a security arm of a transatlantic democratic community that works cooperatively with others in the world. Uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski in a foreign affairs article referred to this as a, as a hub because of the capacities that coordinates with others. That's probably a, an overstatement in terms of the degree of directiveness. It shouldn't be directive. Uh, it is just one part of a network in the world, but it is a, a substantial part. Uh, transatlantic community still uh, constitutes the major source of political capacity, economic uh, strength, the economic well-being, 
uh, peacekeeping forces, development assistance, uh, opinion shaping, and because of its anchor on democratic values, still remains something of an inspiration to people in the world, although it is not without challenge. Uh, so because of that, the transatlantic community is tremendously important and has a role and a responsibility in addressing security challenges in the 21st century. The only means we have for doing that together is through NATO. Uh, so despite the adaptation that has been done, we need a great deal more adaptation and a great deal more explanation uh, to our publics, uh, to our parliaments, to our political leaders from a expert community why this instrument is important as one piece of the puzzle in addressing these broader challenges that our publics are concerned about. I don't think that adapting NATO on its own uh, will be convincing. I don't think that a group of experts uh, with their report or the hundreds of people who are involved in this process up till now, or frankly the piece of paper that will come out from NATO in November, is itself going to make very much difference. Uh, it's going to be in the minds of people if we can get um, a better understanding about the nature of the challenges we, f we face today in the world and what the role of a security institution like NATO can be in that world. If we can get the idea right, then these papers and then these groups of experts and what we do um, will make a difference because it will be in the implementation that follows. Uh, but the key challenge is to uh, get into the minds of our publics and our political establishments now what this security arm is for. And with that, I'll pause there, and I'd be delighted to ad address questions later on. But I want to turn it over to, to uh, Jamie, uh, who can speak more about the immediate work that has been done and, and where it's going from here. Jamie, you're up. Uh, okay. And first of all, uh, as this is uh, all through the miracle of modern technology, can I just uh, be certain that uh, you can hear me? I think you can see me, but can I just make certain that the sound is okay before I sort of launch into my uh, remarks? Roger. <laughs> Mike, Mike, thank you. Yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you, uh, really uh, thank you all for uh, inviting me today and also for putting up with the fact that I can't be there in person but have to do this via uh, a VTC. But of course, it's still uh, better that way than, than not being there uh, at all. Uh, as you know, with the uh, volcanic ash cloud problems in, in Europe over the last couple of days, any kind of travel has become a very precarious uh, endeavor. Traveled, I was reminded of the Song of the Eagles, remember Hotel California, which I sort of modified slightly to say that you could check in any time you like, but you, you can, can never leave. leave. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> At least my impression is we've got a good VTC ceiling, so that, that's excellent. Well, first of all, uh, always a pleasure to, to follow a uh, good friend and good colleague, Ambassador Kurt Volker. Uh, Kurt, before again I get going, I'd just like to say I saw a Yachter Hoop Skepper uh, this morning in Brussels, he asked me to pass on to you his, his okay. best regards. And uh, when Kurt, uh, at the beginning, described the process for the new strategic concept that we elaborated around his lunch table, um, I also uh, was reminded of something, which is that when the NATO ambassadors uh, last Monday uh, had their initial discussion of the Albright report, the report of the group of experts, uh, obviously, in such a, uh, a comprehensive, broad-ranging report, there are going to be things that they like, like a lot, like less. But one thing that they all emphasized, all of them, that they thought was really good about this was, was the process, the outreach, uh, the engagement to strategic community, taking broad soundings, bringing people in. They love that. They would like it to be the model for NATO's public diplomacy in the future. So, Kurt, uh, I think, uh, without overflattering you, you can take a lot of satisfaction from the fact that that was really the part of the exercise uh, which uh, everybody has been enthusiastic uh, about. Uh, now, when you uh, obviously listen to such a, an accomplished uh, diplomatic communicator like Kurt, you, first of all, you think, God, he said what I would have wanted to say, or he said things that I should have for all to say uh, uh, as well. And I'm not going to come across today as if you like the official uh, trying to contradict what the independent think tank has said. Uh, I, I, I agree with uh, much of what Kurt said about the challenges that NATO faces and the fact that we are under the same institutional pressures to perform uh, as the UN and the EU uh, and everybody else. Uh, but let me at least say a few things about the contents of the group of experts report, particularly as a person who was very much the, the link between Madeleine Albright and her group and NATO. 
uh, and my sense of where it uh, is going to lead as we get uh, started in drafting the actual strategic concept uh, to be uh, approved at NATO's next summit in, in, in Lisbon. I think the first thing to say, of course, is that NATO has been transforming uh, constantly since the end of the Cold War. So Shreveport isn't, if you like, something which tries to reform NATO after a period of stasis or stagnation or, or irrelevance. Uh, it has to build on uh, the fact that a lot of work has been done already in front of the So obviously don't be surprised if the experts have wanted to reaffirm a certain enduring value. Centrality of the Article 5 Collective Defense Commitment, of course. Uh, that's still important for everybody in NATO, but this is no secret, especially for those new member states that joined after 1989 and who still do not want to totally rule out uh, the prospects of a conventional conflict in Europe and who were looking in this exercise uh, of the group of experts to obtain what they call strategic reassurance, in other words, not just a reaffirmation of NATO's commitment to Article 5, but also certain uh, measures like contingency planning, Article 5 exercises, which we haven't had much in recent years, um, uh, NATO visibility on their territories. So to make certain that uh, Article 5 doesn't simply become a paper guarantee, but is backed up by real hardcore uh, defense arrangements. Another thing that to any more continuity and change is the commitment to a mix of nuclear uh, and conventional uh, forces. Uh, to uphold uh, uh, deterrence, and therefore, uh, Madeleine Albright and her colleagues were rather status quo, uh, despite the uh, current debate which is starting on both sides of the Atlantic uh, re uh, regarding a world without nuclear weapons or uh, the increasing our reliance or the salience of nuclear weapons in our strategy. The group clearly thought that although the goal uh, is a very worthy one, uh, it, it, NATO is not yet in a position where we should be making the first move. Uh, the third element, so obviously the transatlantic link, uh, the open door comes next, uh, reasserting that. Uh, if it's not likely to happen anytime soon in terms of another NATO enlargement, it becomes, I think, all the more important to restate our commitment to the principle so that we don't discourage the reformers in Central and Eastern Europe and beyond who aspire to NATO membership. And, and of course, the, the partnerships that can't be referred to that, which we have developed uh, over the last few years. So reaffirmation is, is, is not such a bad uh, thing because it's very important for allies not simply to sort of plot new directions to NATO, uh, for NATO, but to make sure as we go off in new directions that we're not sort of losing sight of some of the basics, which frankly for them are, are more important. Yes, uh, uh, they want the new NATO, but they want the old NATO as well. And therefore, it's not a question of the king is dead, long live the king. It's a question of how we sort of marry the old and the new in a way that doesn't overload the alliance, uh, uh, but takes account of the fact that uh, NATO is no longer uh, uh, a sort of a one horse race. Uh, the days are gone. I mean, we could get by simply by uh, in performing one function, such as the Article 5 deterrence during the Cold War. But the fact is, NATO has to be a lot more things to a lot more people uh, uh, today uh, to obtain, to continue to have the, uh, the uh, commitment. Uh, of our member states, and I think one of the problems with this type of exercise is that if you do too little, you're not going to achieve that consensus, but if you try to do too much, then of course you're going to make NATO uh, a less and less of a puzzle of organization. So, so it's not a question of either or, it's often a question of how do we find the essential balance. For example, the balance between collective defense, defense at home, waiting to be attacked, as we used to call it, but going beyond our territory territory to places like Afghanistan, as we did in the Balkans in the 90s, to confront threats at, at, at source. And uh, different countries uh, put a different weighting uh, on the priority between Article 5 at home or collective defense uh, of our interests uh, beyond our uh, territory. Another clear one is, is the, that those allies that put very much the emphasis on defense uh, with perhaps Russia at the back of their minds, uh, even if that's uh, no longer what it was, of course, uh, in the days of the Soviet Union, uh, and those allies who believe very much in a open policy of re-engagement with Russia. Now, of course, again, uh, it's not either or, we need to do both. But by trying to craft the right balance in the all tribunals, I think what the group of experts are trying to do is convince those countries that want strategic reassurance that they now have enough of that to be able also to accept the re-engagement with Russia, 
and those countries that want to re-engage with, with Russia uh, to mm. also understand and accept that this will be easier for the alliance as a whole to do if those uh, allies that want the engagement with Russia have the strategic reassurance uh, for the Eastern allies uh, uh, seriously. Similarly, uh, those allies, of course, that want to move on nuclear disarmament, uh, but see that there are others who are still attached to the time being to a mix of nuclear and conventional weapons, including, of course, the uh, U.S. substrategic strategy in Europe, they would like uh, clearly to see that uh, at least NATO is taking the non-proliferation disarmament arms seriously. This is an area where we were active, you recall, during the Cold War. Remember the SS-20s, the Cruz and Pershing, the consultations on the INF Treaty, the Special Consultative Group. Frankly, it's been an area where NATO has been less active in recent years. You have not seen uh, uh, the NATO Secretary General at the NPT Review Conference. It's precisely because NATO has not been formally playing a, a, a role. The question is how can we be more active as an alliance in pushing international arms control agenda in, in the future. And then I'll just give you another uh, idea of where balances have to be struck. There are those who believe that in the wake of our experience in Afghanistan, we should develop more civilian expertise and planning capability. Not, not because NATO is suddenly going to be the EU or the UN. Uh, we're not going to duplicate what those organizations have, but because there is a sense that we can't always rely upon them being in the same places as us, with the same priorities, the same financial uh, means, the same assets. And uh, uh, even if uh, they will be there, we need at the very minimum to be able to fill the vacuum with uh, civilian assets of our own until they arrive. But of course, on the other hand, there are allies who worry that this is, if you like, uh, the, uh, uh, the beginning of a, of a kind of mission creep and that uh, uh, we should not sort of convey the message to these other organizations that we are seeking to replace them in their civilian functions or that we don't need them any longer. So, so don't be surprised, ladies and gentlemen, if in a very complex organization like NATO with more and more members with more and more different interests, according to history, according to geography, uh, with more and more security challenges. Gulf War could very admirably outline those security challenges. Um, the question of NATO is, is how much can we get away with doing
before the, the hall. So I like, frankly, and I, I think this is the right way to go, that uh, the group of experts have said that clearly NATO has to look at other challenges as well, which don't necessarily mean sending troops, and which can't be solved by sending troops. Uh, and Kurt mentioned many of them, but the preparation aspect, the cyber aspect, the energy security uh, aspects, uh, mass uh, hyper-terrorism. However, I think it's also clear from our experience over the last few years that not all of these challenges are ones where NATO has uh, uh, a lot to contribute, even if we have to monitor them. Uh, I believe, for example, that the emphasis of the group on cyber and uh, proliferation, the threat of missile uh, attacks and attacks of weapons of mass destruction, are the two which are most urgent for NATO, and the ones where NATO probably has the most to contribute, even if not in an exclusive way. Energy security, I've looked at that in great depth, is a major issue, I agree with Kurt, but I think the EU, which looks more at market forces, regulation, storage, construction of pipelines, is in a better position than us. So I think the new challenge is yes, but strict prioritization. The group, uh, I think, has, has, has done that. I think the second area is, uh, and Kurt mentioned this again, is partnerships. We, one of the things that we've realized from Afghanistan is, uh, is not only the strength of NATO, who else could do that kind of high demanding, high tempo military operation where the United States is playing the leading role, but with the European allies and others alongside. But uh, uh, it's also the case that uh, we need 18 uh, non-NATO countries, exactly, uh, uh, to support us. And yeah. some of those non-NATO countries, Kurt mentioned them, Australia, Japan, New Zealand, are making major military and financial uh, contributions. If you take away the partners, ISAF would lose a good proportion of its effectiveness. They're not really there for symbolic purposes. And therefore, the whole question now comes about that if we are going to become an organization which takes a more global view of the challenges, which is able to operate globally, we need not simply to ring up the partners when we want troops from them. Uh, I don't think we could sustain a relationship with them on that kind of basis alone. But we need to try to engage them more generally in talking about threats where they, of course, are as much part of the solution as, as we are. And that's why, as you know, the Secretary General of NATO, you have the, uh, excuse me, <laughs> I have the up on the mind frame today, I saw him this morning, but uh, uh, Anders von Rasmussen, has precisely suggested trying to build this kind of global partnership uh, concept. I, I agree with you <laughs> strongly that we shouldn't do this as a hub, uh, we shouldn't sort of suggest it some fancy new institution which would obviously uh, uh, frighten away the Chinese or the Indians, not to speak of the Russians, and make us look like a rival to the United Nations. But still, I think that this is some, an area where, provided we do it incrementally uh, on issues of common interest, we should certainly move uh, ahead. Um, let me mention just two final things before I stop. One thing which I think is going to be a real test case for the vision, which is outlined in Secretary Albright's uh, report, uh, is uh, the uh, idea of resurrecting Article 4. Um, Kirk was ambassador to NATO, and he has a long experience, and I'm not sure if he would uh, agree with this perception of mine, but uh, NATO has tended to, uh, I believe, narrow down far too much its political consultation to those uh, uh, areas of the world where it's conducting operations. As I said, the troops tend to go first, the political attention follows. And uh, therefore, we spent about 90% of our time, 80% of our time discussing Afghanistan. Well, in a way, that's needed. It's the most important demanding mission. But if we really are going to take this more global view, then clearly the Europeans and the Americans, the Canadians, have to use NATO more as the key forum for the transatlantic strategic dialogue. This is not a new theme. It's been talked about for years. If you remember by uh, uh, Chancellor Schroeder at Verkunda a few years ago, but we haven't managed really to do it. And then, therefore, the big question is, can we really use Article 4 as a kind of crisis management article without the worry that if we evoke Article 4, it automatically is going to lead to Article 5 and some kind of NATO uh, action? Uh, will the Americans be prepared to use NATO? The Europeans with the common foreign and security policy of the European Union, will they be prepared, nonetheless, to go outside that exclusive EU framework to also uh, deal with the US and the other allies. So I think it's a fascinating idea. Will it happen? That's a good question. And finally, I think Kurt is absolutely right. You can't have a, a new NATO mission statement without a new NATO organization to implement it. And uh, I think the report has lots of good things to, to say on uh, where we need to become leaner, uh, not to become 
leaner, but become more efficient. Uh, the one problem, however, I is that when we say leaner, many of our allies think, ah, that's simply an excuse to give NATO less money. That's simply an excuse to fire a lot of people. Uh, 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 you know, anything that's smaller is better. Now, I'm the first person to acknowledge uh, that we need to compress the command structure, we need to make things more efficient and mobile, we need to cut out duplication, we need to reform NATO agencies, and we need to cut the number of committees, quite right. Uh, but um, at the same time, let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Let's come up with a vision which is geared towards a more efficient alliance, and therefore we prioritise and shift the resources around, uh, and let, let's not present reform only uh, as a budget cutting but there is no doubt, Kurt referred to the Euro crisis, which is really biting deep over here, uh, and there's no doubt we are going to have to get by with less in the future. Uh, can this be an opportunity uh, to rationalise our defence capabilities, uh, to have more common funding, more common capabilities, rather than simply something that's going to eviscerate NATO from one salami slice to another? I don't know, but I think there is a challenge there. Um, I agree with Kurt. You can't, uh, if you like, magically conjure up a new NATO simply through a document. And there are documents that reflect a real consensus, and there are documents that reflect a sham consensus. So I take that entirely. So at the end of the day, what is the, what matters is not so much what is written on a piece of paper uh, that emerges from the summit in Lisbon, but whether that piece of paper uh, reflects a true meeting of minds of the Allies around a sort of revi revitalized sense of NATO's core purpose and a set of missions which they are generally willing to sign up to and, and, and implement, in which case it will be uh, decisive, or will it be papering over the cracks of our inability to find those balances or, or uh, become the, the vice chair of the group of experts for it, uh, uh, the jack of all threats, the bathroom <laughs> Thank you. Yes, everybody's still listening. Very definitely, Jamie. Thank you for those comments. I'm going to ask Kurt if he has a rejoinder or two that he'd like to comment or two he'd like to make before we uh, open it up, and I'll give you another chance too, Jamie. Go ahead, Kurt. Okay. Um, good. This is on. Thanks. No, I, I was listening to Jamie. I think you uh, you did a tremendous job, sort of covering uh, the range of issues that uh, are being grappled with here, and, and looking a little bit ahead. Uh, there is, you closed on this point, and, and it was one that struck me that I thought maybe we should explore a little bit and maybe uh, as we move into question and answer. But in a way, what this group of experts report does is it says that, well, a number of things have to be in balance. We have to have a balance of how much we are an expeditionary NATO going to places like Afghanistan and how much we're doing core Article 5 collective defense here at home. Uh, we have to have a balance in how much we protect against Russia versus how much we engage Russia. Uh, we have to have a balance on how much we do the traditional military sorts of, of defense versus how much we get into the new threats and challenges, whether it's cyber, or energy, and things. We've got to have a balance on all these things. And the problem, in a way, is when you add up all of these things getting the right balance, it may make tremendously good sense to experts like you and me, but... It doesn't sound terribly strategic, and it doesn't sound terribly persuasive. Uh, it, it seems to be all things for all people all the time, and it just doesn't, it, it, it doesn't grab you. And that's where I think we have work to do, is to convey uh, what is the strategic point here? What, why is this organization what it is, and what do we need to do? I, I think that there is a general sense among publics that uh, they would wish for less. Um, they don't want to be extended as much as NATO is extended in as many places and as many operations and as many conflicts. Um, they don't like Afghanistan. Um, they don't really want to have to deal with Russia, but sometimes we have to deal with Russia. Um, and um, we don't have any money. Uh, we're just completely broke. Even um, among the European allies that one would think of as the most um, uh, active contributor to NATO, the UK, uh, at the same time is uh, facing a, a budget deficit, I believe it's 13% uh, 
um, budget deficit, and they've already announced a plan to to take out six billion pounds from the budget this year, and that's only this year. And then we'll see what happens next year. And announced intended cuts in the defense ministry. Uh, so uh, we have both a fatigue factor, we have a resource factor, and we have a, a, a an expert community like us that is is telling leaders and publics and parliaments do everything. And so I think that we need to sharpen our our message and our thinking on that. Um, and uh, I'll pause there, and I'd be very interested to hear, Jamie, if you have thoughts on that, or alternatively, uh, uh, if you want to move to question and answer. Yeah, Jamie, do you have any further comment before we open it up? Yeah, uh, very briefly promise, because I know the, the main point is to, is to have the discussion with the audience. Uh, Kurt, as always, has put his finger uh, on the, uh, the ne- nevralgic point. I don't disagree. It, it's true that a balance uh, is it, not a very clear public message. over so many different uh, functions that none of them will be particularly credible. So he's right. But what I will say uh, is that we cannot move forward at the moment uh, in the alliance in engaging this new, more global agenda of threats if we continue to sort of carry behind this as a dead weight, like the, the fallen chain around the leg of the jailbird, uh, the, some of the big differences of the past, which have been holding us back, as I say, the difference between those who want to engage Russia and those who uh, see us mainly as defending against Russia, uh, those who basically want the old NATO in Europe and, and those who want the NATO beyond. So although the, uh, the, the, uh, the balances may be a temporary affair in the hope that once we've got them sorted out, we can, we can move on, I don't basically see any way of moving on without first uh, uh, addressing them. It's not, of course, the situation that I would like to be in any more than Kurt in coming up with a very clear, very unified vision statement. But I think that's the situation we're in. And I think Madeleine Albright, having you know, been around the capitals and heard so many different things, frankly, in so many different places, was, was aware of that and has made a very good job at tackling it. The, the second thing, though, is, is right. I, 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 even Secretary Gates uh, in the US has made it clear that he's hoping, he hopes the US won't have to do a mission on the scale of of Afghanistan for a very long time to uh, come, and the European uh, budget cuts, and uh, uh, which have even caused Secretary Gates to warn publicly of the disarmament in Europe, uh, are going to make it harder for our member states. So this means that, first of all, we're going to have to do a much better job uh, at getting the capabilities out of the resources we have. And as Kurt knows, we have, uh, even in an era of scarcity, still carried along with us a lot of duplication, particularly on the European side, competing competing aircraft, competing armored personnel carriers. Well, you know, NATO officials have de- decried all of this uh, wastage and duplication, particularly our former boss, uh, George Robertson, uh, but haven't really, but the governments haven't done much about it. So this, if they don't do it in this financial crisis, that kind of rationalization will not take uh, uh, place. Uh, but the other thing, and this is one I'm very briefly make the point, is that if NATO is going to find it harder to do these missions in the future, because we don't have the money, because after Afghanistan we're all, if you like, uh, uh, more cautious, more hesitant, uh, and the bar is, is, is higher, or, and our publics don't support us anyway, then we're going to have to get, as an alliance, much, much more into the prevention business. And, and one thing that Kurt and I both know is that over the last few years, NATO's record on prevention hasn't been particularly good. We've sort of been the, the big military organization that waits for everybody else to mess up waits for the dishes to be broken, and then we go in at vast expense with our troops and, and our budgets to fix the problem in Kosovo or uh, Bosnia or, or Afghanistan. And if we can't do that anymore, then the whole question is, is can NATO be a more agile uh, prevention organization for better crisis management, better anticipation, better intelligence sharing, working with other organizations to handle problems? And one thing that struck me, just and this would be my last point here, uh, in what Secretary of Ge- uh, Secretary Gates recent, recently wrote in his foreign affairs article, is this emphasis now that he puts on, well, you know, helping others to do the job themselves by training, security sector reform, capability building for the African Union or, or whatever, um, so that ultimately, you know, we can be more in a supportive role because it's going to be more difficult for us to be in a leading role. That is a very different focus for the Alliance, but it's reflected in the group uh, of experts report. 
Thank you. The floor is open. Please identify yourself and the microphone will come to you. We have a question over here. First one. Thanks. I'm Vladimir Karamorza with RTVI Television. Um, the question on relations between NATO and Russia. <clears throat> there, was a, um, there was a story in Newsweek in the last few days about um, a supposed new um, foreign policy uh, strategy that President Medvedev is preparing in which the main focus is on uh, warming up relations with uh, the United States, the European Union, and, and NATO, with the West in general. Um, how do you see relations between NATO and Russia developing in this new strategic concept, and um, what, what are the kind of the goals that the benchmarks, is it feasible to think of Russia as a future member of NATO, for instance, at some future date? And just what, what are your general comments? Thanks. Why don't you both comment briefly? Okay. Uh, do you want me to go first, Jamie, or do you want to? Uh, go. Uh, no, go, you go first. All right, well, um, first off, um, from the group of experts report, I think it has a very open approach to Russia, and I think you'll find that in the document. Uh, it uh, doesn't explicitly say that uh, Russia could be a member of NATO in the future, but it's certainly not excluded. And the... Uh, the concept, I think, behind that is that uh, we're all about human values. Uh, we're all about democracy, market economy, rule of law, and individual liberty. And, and this is not something from which any country should be excluded. In fact, the community should be as open as possible. And if we can work together to provide stability and security and the advancement of those values in the world, all the better. Uh, so that's the, the, the underlying concept there. Now, what we found uh, is that uh, despite some very optimistic beginnings to a NATO-Russia relationship with the, um, the Founding Act in 1997, the Permanent Joint Council, an effort to upify this again in 2002, launching the NATO-Russia Council, uh, the, the trends have not been good. The trends have been bad. And during, you know, over that same period of time, NATO-Russia cooperation itself did not advance very far. Uh, Russia, I would argue, did not evince a great deal of interest in working together with NATO, despite the number of things that were put on the table by NATO as areas for cooperation. Uh, there remain a number on the table where NATO continues to say, why don't we do this together, why don't we do that together? Uh, but the cooperation has never really uh, manifested itself. And then in the past few years, we've also seen a retrenchment on uh, democracy, on liberty, on um, um, uh, journalistic freedom, on NGO opportunities, on governance in Russia, uh, which um, brings it further away from this set of shared values. And we've also seen in the neighborhood pressure on neighboring countries, use of energy as a political tool to pressure neighbors. I, I see um, my former colleague at NATO, Yanis Ekmanis, the Latvian ambassador to NATO here, and, and reminds me of pressure on the Baltic states as well, uh, Russia invading Georgia in 2008. Uh, so the, the trend lines have not been good for working together with Russia. In fact, they've been bad. And we would hope um, that we could see cooperation with Russia develop further in the future, and we'd hope to see Russia return to a more open, democratic, and cooperative path with its neighbors in the neighborhood. And, that's, and we're, I think we're prepared for that. So that's the way I would uh, describe it. Jamie did raise, and I agree with him, that there are very different views of how to deal with Russia within NATO. Uh, there would be in Central and Eastern Europe a sense that they feel vulnerable and therefore need protection, and therefore there should be an emphasis on NATO's core mission of collective defense. You have in Western Europe countries that do not feel so vulnerable, and believe that the best way to deal with Russia is through engagement and entangling relationships that may change Russia over time. And you have in the United States a view to prioritize some of the strategic issues, such as a nuclear arms treaty or, uh, or Iran. And uh, these, these three views exist simultaneously within NATO. I would argue that if you put them together, then you've got a good policy, because you can't pursue just one of them Realistically, uh, you need to have a somewhat nuanced and, and comprehensive look at how to deal with a potential concern and a potential ally uh, in Russia uh, to uh, 
chart a course for the future. It shouldn't be all protection. It shouldn't be all engagement. It should be a, 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 a sustainable mixture. And frankly, I would even argue that they reinforce themselves because I think our, our allies in Central and Eastern Europe will feel much more comfortable about engagement if they also feel protected. And our allies in Western Europe will be more comfortable saying, yes, um, we are committed to collective defense of every ally, including those uh, countries that are right up there on Russia's border, provided we also are sure that we are trying to work together with Russia for the future. Uh, so I think these things do fit together well, and though it's, it's hard to argue, as, as Jamie and I pointed out, in favor of a balance, uh, I do think that having a, a complex policy uh, a, a toward Russia in that way is uh, what NATO needs. Uh, Jamie, you want to comment? Thank you. We have two more quick questions, and then we're going to break. Yes, in um, the white, and then you. Uh, my name is Soveda Maani Ewing. I am an independent scholar and writer on issues of collective security. Um, I was fascinated uh, particularly by the comments of uh, Mr. Volker, uh, Ambassador Volker. I, I appreciate your <laughs> your comments, particularly on, on the fact that we, we need to engage the public, and we need to help folks understand why NATO is doing what it's doing. Apropos of which, um, I, 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 have, I have a couple of thoughts, and I wonder um, what your views are on them. The first is that one of the most uh, glaring uh, holes that we have in our institutional infrastructure around the world is um, the absence of an international standing force. We talk about having hopes that no major conflicts will erupt uh, in the near future, to which we, as the United States, will have to commit our forces. The fact is, looking at the trends over the last couple of decades, we can almost guarantee that we are going to have more conflicts. They're going to be more sensitive, larger. We're going to have more than one at a time. 
and that we're running out of resources as, as an individual nation, both in terms of finances and troop, our willingness to commit troops. So, I mean, it seems um, rather obvious, <coughs> and it's, it's sort of the elephant in the room that nobody seems to want to, to mention, that the international community has to finally grab the bull by the horn, so to speak, and, um, and do what it set out to do in the United Nations Charter under Articles 42 and 43, and somehow slowly create an international standing force so we're not in an awkward position of trying to either cobble coalitions together um, uh, or go it alone. Uh, with all the ramifications and the backfiring that leads from that. I wonder in this regard whether NATO could uh, start to play some role, if we could sort of bridge the gap and say, well, all right, let's look at NATO as a nucleus for that sort of international standing force in two ways. Um, we have a model that we can use. Could we start to mindfully replicate this model in different regions around the world? And then do using a word that you used when you were speaking, Ambassador Volker, network, network these regional forces and eventually work our ways towards some international coordination under a Security Council or General Assembly, revamped hopefully, so that we have an international standing force to which all nations contribute. Obviously, I do understand that we're all at completely different levels. Our, our technologies are at different levels. So this is a second role in which a NATO could play. It's already started to do so, training these forces, um, helping um, regions such as it, it's already doing with Africa, develop and train these forces, um, but do it mindfully, as I say, start creating them in Latin America, in Southeast Asia, in Northeast Asia, et cetera, et cetera, in the Gulf area. This will then lead to an issue that, that um, um, Jamie Shea raised, which is the issue of disarmament. I think that once we have an international system that actually works, nations will be more willing to give up their arms, whether they're nuclear arms or conventional arms, because there will be an article akin to Article 5 um, of the NATO Treaty in force for everybody, not just for a small group of allies, but all nations will feel an attack on one of us is an attack against all. And the entire international community will stand up as one and use this international force to which everybody is committed and contributed. Now, I, I do understand this is a process. It's not going to happen overnight. But if we have a vision and we break it into smaller steps and start working towards it, is this something that you have thought of or think is feasible or think we could at least begin working on so that maybe 70 years from now we could perhaps be there if we started today? Fascinating. Sure. Hey, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Well, that's a, a, a that's fascinating a question, <laughs> uh, and I really appreciate it. Um, many <coughs> things to say about it, and I'll try not to go on at great length because I know we're, we're up against time pressure here. Uh, the first thing is that um, a, a small point that doesn't challenge your idea, but, but just something to, to keep in mind, uh, standing forces, use of that phrase, standing, are really expensive, really expensive, um, because um, it, it implies a certain sense of, of place, where they are, and upkeep, and readiness, and equipping, and ready deployment. And I, I know this because about eight, nine years ago, I proposed a NATO standing force um, the NATO reaction force that we now have was originally proposed as the NATO standing reaction force. And I got an earful from my colleagues in the military about what a bad idea that was. And I actually have to say they were right. <laughs> and we ended up instead creating a NATO reaction force, which they still didn't like, but eventually took on board. And, and I, I think is a fundamentally very, very good idea uh, because what it does is it sets um, standards of readiness, identifies specific forces that exist in nations, uh, exercises them, so that even though it's not a standing force, it's real. And, and the reason that we needed this, and I believe still need it, is that prior to the NATO reaction force, any time NATO needed to conduct a military operation, you had to go out with a tin cup and start from scratch. So who's out there? Who wants to contribute? How does it work? And it worked fine when it was Bosnia. And it sort of worked fine when it was Kosovo. 
But after that, people got tired of it. And the further away from home, people got tired of it. So creating the NATO Response Force was a terrific idea. And that, in a way, is already beginning to do what I think you're looking for. Because we're identifying real forces. NATO is leading operations. It is working together with partner countries. And there's no bar on who can be a partner country or a contributing country. There are 40-some countries in Afghanistan right now. Uh, we do share interoperability standards. We do try to exercise and work together. Uh, the, the problem that I see with an international standing force uh, is no one wants to contribute in a void. Why are we going to put up stuff um, when we don't know what it's for? What are we, what are we buying into? Uh, so I don't see the contributions there. But to create the mechanisms for interoperability, networked, again, as, as you said that, it's, a, it's part of a global network, uh, where we can integrate contributions from any different country, and it can be shifting because not all countries will share the same interest in the same set of issues. Uh, I don't have any illusion that we're going to see, you know, Paraguayan peacekeepers uh, in Afghanistan anytime soon. Uh, but there might be something for which we could work together with, with Paraguay, and even in the training areas, as you mentioned, this is largely what the, the vision is with what we're trying to do with the African Union to build up their capacities in peacekeeping. So I think you're on to something, but I do think it has to be uh, a little bit more uh, dispersed in order to be both efficient and to give political confidence to those who would be contributing. Um, uh, Mike Hotzel, do you have a 30 second comment? 15 seconds. 15. Like or not? Uh, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Two weeks ago, in an op ed in the International Herald Tribune, Vice President Joseph Biden advocated the creation of this sort of standing force, but under the auspices of the OSCE, not NATO, not the UN. I wonder if we could comment on that. Jamie, I um, I just took up a lot of time. When did you? Um... <laughs> Very quick, because we have one more question, and I've already failed in being on time. Yep. Um, yep. I, I know this is going to be rather boring, but uh, <laughs> Convention, so I agree with Kurt on this one. I don't believe in the idea of one single standing force. Uh, it was proposed by Boutros Boutros Ghali, of course, in his agenda for peace uh, for UN reform back in the 90s. The problem is, is that there are so many different of the world that you need more than one fire brigade and if it's committed in place x it of course can't be in places y or, or z the other thing by the way is that governments today tend to go as Kurt said under a variety of different banners the nato banner uh, many of the europeans now are going under an eu banner in, in various operations in coalitions of the women uh, for the europeans uh, more than the united states also participation in u.s blue helmet operations so i think the idea of uh, of rapid reaction capabilities able to operate under a different uh, series of, of packs but to the same high standards of interoperability and training uh, is, is the most practical way uh, forward. The earmarking system, if you like, uh, even that's not perfect because uh, the governments don't always necessarily want to offer those forces, even where they have them. That's a case of political will. But at least the idea of e e countries having a reserve of rapid reaction Thank you. The, la the last question. Be quick, please. Yes. It's, uh, I would appreciate any comment on the, the other challenge of um, uh, NATO, possible challenge, uh, its expansion. The accession of Macedonia, actually, I didn't rec uh, uh, introduce myself. My name is Yulia Velkovska. I work for Voice of America and Macedonian Service. Mm -hmm. And the accession of Macedonia to NATO is currently pending as of 2009. NATO's invitation to Macedonia was blocked by Greece at the Bucharest summit. 
the alliance agreed that uh, as long as the name dispute uh, with Greece will resolve, the invitation will, uh, uh, will uh, you know, uh, up to receive an invitation upon resolution of the name uh, dispute. Recently, uh, Mr. Walker said that um, uh, it is tragic that the name of Macedonia as a country has prevented that nation from moving forward into NATO and EU, uh, EU membership. So I would uh, appreciate any uh, perspective yeah. on that elaboration sure. and also from Mr. Sheen really briefly because we are obviously out of time. Jamie, did you hear that? <coughs> For 10 years. <laughs> Uh, sure, and I'll try to be quick. First off, uh, I, st I, I agree with my own statement. It is tragic. <laughs> it is really tragic because uh, what we want to see is, again, human development, uh, democracy, market economy, rule of law, stability, security, and we have a lot of unfinished business in the Balkans. Um, the region should be becoming a part of the mainstream of Europe. It has every right to develop in the same ways that Western Europe and Central Europe have developed. And this sort of thing is holding it back. Um, and I think, uh, as Jamie said, um, it, it is on both sides of the border where compromise needs to take place. It's not just on one side. Um, people need to be putting the interests of citizens and, and their well-being um, first and foremost and find ways to manage issues of identity and name and language and so forth without preventing that long-term human development, which is what right now is being prevented. And just to, to add one thought on Michael Hotzel's question about the OSCE and, and peacekeeping, uh, I, I think that it, we've seen within NATO already how hard it is to handle issues of a mandate and rules of engagement, solidarity within a mission, and one that we have handled within NATO is, is command and control, but that's also really hard, and we're lucky that we manage this in NATO. And I just have a hard time imagining how you would handle those things in the OSCE when you don't have a shared set of values and a shared basis on which to operate. Uh, I want to thank uh, both Jamie and Kurt for getting the conference off to a great start. Again, a hearty welcome to all of you to the Woodrow Wilson Center. There will be a 15-minute break, and Sam Wells will moderate the uh, second panel. Thank you for being here, and thank our speakers. Thank you.